Would you pray with me? Now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be a pleasing and acceptable sacrifice in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Let the people of God say, Amen. On the wall in my office at home hangs a cartoon picture that is meant to remind me of an important truth. In the picture, you see a dragon resting its back against a tree, having just enjoyed a delicious meal. And the dragon is flossing its teeth with a knight's lance. You see armor scattered about on the grass. You see the shield not too far off in the distance. And long off in the distance, you see a castle. And it becomes evident that the dragon has just enjoyed what one might refer to as a night kebab. And it's not just the picture, it's the caption that captures my attention, especially since I've served in churches and since I'm speaking now to seminarians. The caption reads as follows. No matter how hard you work, no matter how right you are, sometimes the dragon wins. And that might sound a bit strange to hear a Trinity professor confess and even admit that sometimes the dragon wins. I do not mean to sound disrespectful or defeatist when I say it. Rather, what I mean to do is I mean to sound real. I mean to tell the truth about life and ministry in a fallen world. When faced with a choice between being romantic and being real, this text compels me to choose to be real. No matter how hard you work, no matter how right you are, sometimes the dragon wins. See, life has a way of disrupting our plans, disrupting your plans, disrupting my plans. So often there's a gap between our plans and the way things really are. I think of that theologian Mike Tyson who liked to say everyone has a plan until he gets punched in the mouth. See, there is that gap that is so difficult to close, the gap between our plans and the way things really are. For example, when you started at TED's, you were planning to get a 4.0 GPA, but there's a gap between your plans and the way things really are. Uh, when you had your Greek midterm or Hebrew midterm, you were planning to ace it, but there's a gap between your plans and the way things really are. I know that when 2017 began, I was planning to lose 10 to 15 pounds, but there's a gap between my plans and the way things really are. If I might get more serious for a moment. You were planning to have enough money to make it through seminary. You were planning to have a job when you graduated. You were planning for your marriage to work out differently, planning for your kids to grow up differently. You were planning for things to be better than they are. But it is so often the case that life has a way of disrupting our plans. Sometimes the dragon wins, or at least it feels that way sometimes. I think that if there's anyone who understands what it's like to feel this way, to feel discouragement, to feel disillusionment, and even to feel despair, it's Jeremiah, this reluctant prophet, this suffering prophet, understood what it was like that life does not always go according to our plans. The context reveals to us so much about why he experiences this lament and sorrow, this despair, this disruption. We see at the beginning of the chapter that Pasher has gotten word back to him that Jeremiah in the earlier chapter had been, let's just say, moving the, temp moving the furniture around in the temple complex. 
At the beginning of chapter 19, Jeremiah is instructed by the Lord to take a pot and smash it before the people and explain to them that the ruins of the plans of Judah and Jerusalem, that they also will be ruined just like this clay pot. In the second half of chapter 19, at beginning at verse 14, Jeremiah gets up in the court of the temple of the Lord and explains that the Lord will visit judgment upon his people for their stiff-neckedness, for their disobedience. Let's just say that Jeremiah the prophet was not preaching a convenient word. Word gets back to Pasher the priest that Jeremiah the prophet has been stirring up trouble in the temple system. And so we read at the beginning of verse 2 that Pasher the priest had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks in the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. Beaten up, put in the stocks. Now when we picture stocks, we might picture something in particular. Some commentators think that it was some sort of rack on which he was twisted and contorted. Notice that he has made a public spectacle out in front of the upper gate of Benjamin. Pasher, the priest, is not too happy with the word that Jeremiah has to preach. You see, it takes courage to preach the truth, courage to stand up, to speak truth to power. It takes courage to stand up for God. But Pasher won't have any of it. He's not particularly interested in this sort of message. So Pasher has Jeremiah beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin. You know, I find it curious that the threat to Jeremiah's life does not come from a pagan king, but from a powerful priest. Isn't it interesting that it comes from inside the religious establishment instead of outside of it? What you see is you see two different ministers with two radically different visions of ministry coming into conflict with one another. Pastor, the priest, more than likely is more interested in conserving and preserving the status quo, the way things are. Whereas Jeremiah, the prophet, is more interested in uprooting and tearing down the way things seem to be. So you have two different ministers with two radically different visions of ministry coming into conflict with one another. It's a good thing that ministers with different visions of ministry don't butt heads anymore like they used to in the Bible. Now if we pause just for a moment and reflect on Pasher's ministry, we cannot overlook its dangerous implications for today. You see, it's much more difficult for you to speak truth to power when you enjoy the trappings of power. It's much more difficult for you to critique the system when you reap the benefits of the system. How treacherous it can be to genuflect before powers of an age that is passing away. How dangerous it can be to advance our agendas and forget about God. How swift is the declension from a ministry of influence to participation in collusion? Gardner Taylor puts it this way. Whenever corrupt religion and crooked government collude, Jesus Christ is crucified all over again. Jeremiah does not have good news for Pasher, does he? After Pasher releases him in verse 3, the Lord, the Lord speaks through Jeremiah who says to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pasher, but terror on every side. How would you like to be renamed terror on every side? Pasher will not only become a terror to himself, but a terror to those around him. God will visit judgment upon him and on his family and all those to whom he prophesied lies. The king of Babylon will come and carry them off into exile and carry the people off into exile along with all of the products, all of the valuables, all of the treasuries of the kings of Judah. No, it's not good news for Pasher the priest. And it's not good news for anyone who genuflects before powers of an age that is passing away. 
And then we come to Jeremiah's complaint. And it's really his lament. I said at the beginning that life has a way of disrupting our plans. Let me say here that discouragement has a way of destroying our confidence. And Jeremiah is discouraged. Discouragement in all of its difficulty, all of its desperation, all of its disillusionment, all of its despair. Discouragement has a way of destroying our confidence in God, our confidence in others, even our confidence in the merits of our own existence in the world. It was the commentator Derek Kidner who said that the heightened language is not there to be analyzed. It is there to bowl us over. Now, there are two main sources of Jeremiah's discouragement. I'll deal with them in opposite order. Let me start with this. The first source of his discouragement is the discouragement that he experiences on account of the ridicule and mockery and scorn that he faces from those around him. Look at verse 7, the second half. We'll get to the first half in a moment. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Some of you may have the phrase, I am a laughing stock. It's meant to communicate that Jeremiah has become the butt of people's jokes. I am a laughing stock. Everyone mocks me, he says. If you skip ahead to verse 10, it shows up again. He says, I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Do you remember that name? It happens, that phrase occurs five times in the book of Jeremiah, and in almost every instance it uh, is with reference to the enemies of God, the enemies of Israel. It's as if Jeremiah has come to the conclusion that the people around him no longer see him as a faithful prophet speaking on behalf of God. Instead, they see him as a false prophet spreading lies. Denounce him, they say. Let's denounce him. Notice that the source of Jeremiah's difficulty from those around him is not coming from his enemies, but from his friends. Look at verse 10 again. All my friends are waiting for me to slip. Some of you might have are watching for my fall. It's this idea of halting or stumbling or tripping. They are saying perhaps he will be deceived, then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him with friends like these who needs enemies all of my friends are waiting for my fall watching for my foot to slip jeremiah faces discouragement because those around him insist on ridicule and mockery and scorn remember that when he was put in the stocks he was made a public spectacle so that all would take heed, so that all would be warned that this is what happens to prophets who move the furniture around. But that's not the only source of his discouragement. There's a second one that I think is far worse. If you look back at verse 7, Jeremiah says, You deceived me, Lord. And I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. You see, we know intellectually that if God is for us, who can be against us? But sometimes viscerally, in the raw emotion of human existence, we wonder if God is against us rather than for us. Those verbs there, you deceived me, you overpowered and prevailed against me. Some of you might have, you seduced or enticed me. It's this idea of being violated, of being assaulted by God. For it's one thing to be betrayed by your enemies and another thing to be betrayed by your friends. But to feel as if you have been betrayed by God, that's when you are tempted to lapse into despair. You know, the list is long of preachers who experienced what Jeremiah experienced, didn't they? I thought of Jerina Lee, who 
On one particular day, she was lobbying for women's ordination with Richard Allen. And just in a short span of time, her husband died unexpectedly, and she was a materially poor, physically unhealthy, single mother of two children, ages two and four months. Life has a way of disrupting our plans. I thought of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who after the 21st, 21st anniversary of his time at Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, came down with a case of rheumatism and gout that was so severe that he was homebound for weeks. He wrote in his journal, legs and feet are useless except for the suffering. On this anniversary of the Reformation, I thought of Martin Luther, who was prone to bouts of depression that were so severe that he considered taking his own life. In the year 1527, Luther had a physical and mental breakdown and had to stay in the hospital for a time. In a letter to a friend just one month removed from his breakdown, Luther wrote, I was for more than a whole week really in death and in hell. My whole body stricken so that my limbs still tremble. I almost completely lost Christ in waves and storms of despair and blasphemy against God. Oh yes, the list is long of those who experience this deep, deep discouragement which threatened to destroy their confidence. It's important for us to remember this. And there are a few reasons one of them is this, graduating from a school of divinity is not the same thing as graduating from the school of adversity. You see, it could be entirely possible for you to get a four point at seminary and miss the whole point of seminary. It's in times of difficulty and trial when our faith is tested, when we must really decide what we believe about God. There's another reason. Life being what it is, unpredictable, difficult, sometimes quite painful. I think of the phrase that Don Newton once said in a letter to a friend. There are times when we must be trained a while in the school of disappointment. For reasons known only to God, Sometimes we matriculate in that school for a while. Let me ask you a question. Is there space in your theology for sorrow and despair? Is there space for lament and complaint? Is there space for life to throw a rock through the stained glass window of your system? Or is there no space for that? And if there is no space for that, it's really difficult to get your mind around what Jeremiah is saying here. And it will be that much more difficult when the shadow passes across your path. I remember the year 2004, uh, Jen and I were married in an outdoor ceremony in southern Oregon. It was 90 degrees outside, but it was about 100 degrees in my tuxedo and shoes probably about 110 in all the layers that Jen was wearing in her wedding dress. It was a beautiful ceremony, a delightful, delightful day. We went on our honeymoon, we went to the Pacific Northwest, drove around along the coast, went to Northern California. It was a wonderful, wonderful time together that I'll always cherish. Around the second to last day of our honeymoon, Jen received a phone call from her sister they found out that their biological fa father was suffering from terminal cancer. He found out just a few days before the ceremony, but did not want to tell us because he wanted us to concentrate on the joy of the occasion. About six weeks later, we moved to Scotland where I began a one-year degree program 
and Jen called her dad several times a week, checked in with him, asked him how the chemo was going. He was told that he would have three years with treatment and one year without treatment, so of course he chose treatment. She would call him, check in with him, spend time with him on the phone and ask how he was doing. We even bought plane tickets in order to visit him in Puerto Rico over Christmas break. We were going to be there for two and a half weeks. But as sometimes happens, our plans don't always match up with the way things really are. We got a phone call in early November letting us know that he had passed just four months after diagnosis. So we flew down to Puerto Rico, we spent some time with the family there, went to the funeral. We went back to New Jersey, spent a little time with my folks, and we realized that we hadn't been to church in a couple of weeks, just with all of the wildness and commotion and disruption, we hadn't been to church, it had been a while since we had been. So we went to the church where I grew up, and we had a chance to worship there, and everything was going fine, everything was great until the choir got up and sang the offertory. They sang a song called, There is a Balm in Gilead. It is an old spiritual. I'll just read a few lines. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged, and I feel my works in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. At that moment, as tears were rolling down our face, we were reminded that even in the dark night of the soul, even in the storms that rage against us sometimes. But even then, there are reasons to choose hope. What does Jeremiah see as he gazes out in this scene that begins with him in the stocks and ends with him cursing the day that he was born? Did you notice that? What does he see? in the midst of his trial and tribulation, as he finds himself caught in the crucible of affliction, what does he see? Here's what I think he sees. The God who calls us is stronger than the stocks that grip us. I want you to look back at these verses one more time. And I want you to notice that even... Though the night is dark and the clouds have gathered, that there are these little rays of hope that Jeremiah holds on to even in the midst of his suffering. So we start with verses 7 through 9. Yes, Jeremiah says that he has been deceived by God, assaulted, violated even. Yes, he knows that he has become a laughingstock, that everyone mocks him. Yes, he knows that the word of the Lord has brought him insult and reproach all day long. That's the end of verse 8. But I want you to look at verse 9. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Now, some preachers like to use this verse to romanticize the glory and grandeur that is preaching. <laughs> but if you look at it in its context, and you look at some of the uses of the expression, especially in Jeremiah 6, it's meant to communicate more of a sense of urgency and burden, and at least in Jeremiah 6, the context of judgment. So it's not about being romantic and regal, it's about being raw and real. What does Jeremiah come to see and what must we come to see? The mission of God matters more than our disrupted plans. Did you hear it? The word is in my heart like a fire. 
It's like a fire shut up in my bones. Indeed, I'm weary of holding it in. I cannot. There's an urgency there. There's a conviction there. There's a realization there that the mission of God is bigger than any one individual person. It's much bigger than how any one person feels at any one particular point in time. It's a fire shut up in his bones. Now that's a burden to preach, isn't it? It's this burden to preach that causes the Apostle Paul to say in 1 Corinthians 9, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. It's this burden to preach that causes Stephen to stand before the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts and to say that the Lord Jesus is the one who the patriarchs longed for, who Moses spoke about, who the prophets predicted, even in the face of death. It's this burden to preach that caused the Lord Jesus himself, the scriptures say, to set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. And it's this burden to preach that causes us to keep saying yes to God. His word is in my heart like a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. That's the first ray of hope. But there's a second ray of hope. It's in verse 11. Jeremiah has just said that people have renamed him terror on every side. He has just said that even his friends are looking for him to fall and hoping that they will prevail over him and take revenge on him. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 11. But, I love the use of that word in Scripture. But the Lord is with me like what? Like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them for to you. I have committed my cause. There's that conviction again. That imagery that the Lord is a warrior, that's rich imagery in the Old Testament. In the Song of Moses, in Exodus 15, verse 3, Moses sings, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Sometimes the imagery is used to talk about how God will fight Israel's battles. And other times it's used to talk about how the Lord will fight against Israel for its disobedience and rebellion. But there is another use a more eschatological use, that there is a Lord who will one day make things right. A Lord who will one day set right what has been wrong. Jeremiah understands that this God, the one who is the warrior who fights for Israel, is his God, his mighty warrior. Notice the phrase again, the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. That means that Jeremiah has come to the realization, even in a passage that begins with suffering and ends with suffering, he's come to the realization that even in the storm there's a bright ray of hope. For the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, he says. He, he fights my battles. He comes to my rescue. He comes to my aid in the face of discouragement and despair. He's with me, Jeremiah says. I want you to notice what happens next. In the midst of his lament, in the midst of his complaint, in the midst of his struggle and hardship and sorrow, Jeremiah worships. Look at verse 13. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. It's interesting, some commentators note that it's, he rescues the life of the needy one in the singular. Some think that Jeremiah is talking about himself here. He's not just a God who rescues lives, he's a God who rescues my life and your life, rescues the life of the needy one. Sing praise to the Lord. 
Give praise to the Lord, Jeremiah said. But there's one more reason for hope. And it's more implicit than explicit, more contextual rather than textual. So you must permit me. Last week, I was reading a Lenten devotional, and I came across a line from G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton writes, I have found only one religion that dares to go down with me into the depth of myself. And it was that phrase, dares to go down with me into the depths, that struck my attention. Because I was, as I was wrestling with this text, I, I kept coming up against a wall. I, I kept thinking to myself, there's really no natural or ordinary person that could really totally understand what Jeremiah is going through here. But then it struck me that there is one person, he's not an ordinary person, there is one person, not so much a natural person, but a supernatural person who understands what Jeremiah is going through. For I do know one person who understood what it was like to experience ridicule and mockery and scorn, who understood what it was like to experience betrayal from friends, who knew what it was like to experience the loneliness of God forsakenness. I know one person who knows what it's like. The scriptures say that he made himself of no reputation. That there was nothing about his appearance that would attract us to him. Nothing that would cause us to desire him. I do know one extraordinary and supernatural person who would understand what it would be like to go through this kind of heartache and sorrow. And I know that I might not sound dignified or professorial when I talk this way, but can I talk about him for a little while? The prophets of old called him the son of man and the son of God, and they called him the ancient of days. Those old preachers used to like to call him the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the rose of Sharon. Some of the preachers of today like to call him a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the storm. Perhaps you know him by another name. Perhaps you know him as the one who rescued you as you were wandering about in the wilderness. The one who brought you back from exile. Perhaps you know him as the one who resuscitated you from death to life. Gardner Taylor calls him an anthem in one word, an oratorio in two syllables. Perhaps you know the person I'm describing. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord who is the lion is the Lord who is the lamb. The God who calls you is stronger than the sky. What that means is that even in the face of discouragement and disappointment, you can keep saying yes to God. Let us pray. You are the God who finds us. You are the God who meets us. And you are the God who understands what it's like. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the privilege that's ours to have a Savior like you. One who endured the stocks so that we might be set free from the stocks. Thank you for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy, which goes before us, which holds us up and sustains us, and which reminds us, even in the face of sorrow and despair, 
there are plenty of reasons to choose hope. Though war break out against us, even then will we be confident. Though an army besiege us, even then will we trust in you. Think of the words of the psalmist, when my foot was slipping, your love, O oh Lord, rescued me. Thank you for being our rescuer, for being our deliverer. And thank you, O oh God, for being a God who comes to our aid. For we pray these things in the strong and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.